Table topics, table topics. But as the table topics master said, I now would like to introduce to you our first speaker of today, who is Mr. Andrew Chu, who is giving his educational speech today. So everyone, please give a warm welcome for Mr. Andrew Chu. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, this will be, right now we'll set up for a 20-minute segment, but I won't do most of the talking. You are going to do most of the talking. This is a interactive session that what we're going to be talking about is how do we go from trying to persuade an audience, trying to reach an audience, and recognizing that it's not really about that. It's about engaging an audience. What is the distinction between the two? How many of you have been in Toastmasters for six months, at least six months? Okay. That's good. So would you say that you're at a point now when you look at an audience, say your Toastmaster audience, you feel reasonably comfortable about whatever you're going to say if it's a prepared speech or if it's a table topic that you know a lot about. Would you say you feel pretty confident? But haven't you noticed that when you're speaking in front of a familiar audience like this, do you notice that there's still a message in your head that you're looking at and you're going, Helen, does she, does she like what I'm saying? Does Aaron really agree with what I'm trying to sell him? Martin here, does he really feel like I'm in control on my message? Have you still noticed that even with, a, you feel reasonably confident that these messages occasionally creep up when you're looking at an audience. Right? There's only, whenever you look at any audience, what, how you see an audience is never what the audience is, it's who you are. More importantly, it's three beliefs. There's always three beliefs that are in front of you whenever you look at any audience. And especially when you're selling, you're doing proposal, in which your management's writing on the outcome, or you're trying to propose to your fiancé, or you're trying to give a speech that you, in your fiber of your being, this is what you stand for. These three beliefs start to come out. And these three are, I need to be liked. I need to be right. I need to be in control. They cloud our beliefs because, in terms of who we are as people, this is your attachment. This is your attachment to the subject, and now you want to bring that same attachment to an audience. You're waiting for Aaron to say, ooh, I like that message, that's really, really cool. You're looking for Helen to say, I get it, I understand what you're saying. You're looking for Martin to say, you are a leader, you are ready for my, I totally get what you're saying. You're waiting for that nod with your audience, and when you do, then you feel like you're engaging. But often when we're talking in front of high stakes audiences, that's not going to be there. You know what Stephen Jobs always said is, whenever he's giving a speech, it's not about him. It's always about his message. And you ever notice how when you see one of his pitches when he used to promote the iPod and iPad, that there was something magical about him, something charismatic. Right? Have you... You, when you hear his pitches, you just go, wow, I wish I could do that, right? Mm -hmm. They had a term for it. They call it a reality distortion field. Whenever he gave the pitch, it was like, in that moment, you really feel like whatever he was saying was completely true. Wouldn't you want to have that same effect with audiences, right? Isn't this why we do Toastmasters? Today, this is what we're going to be talking about, and this is what you're going to be doing how to engage an audience in that same way. How to take your message that's trapped in here, this sell selling point that's trapped in here, and to bring it out there. So as mentioned before, there's three core beliefs that sort of limit how we try to engage with audiences. I need to be liked, I need to be, I need to be right, I need to be controlled. And that ties into our ego. That ties into our attachment with people. In a lot of cases, when we're sharing a story or giving a point, these things arise. But I'm going to demonstrate that right now. 
I'm going to have Helen, Helen, let you come up here. And I'm going to ask Doug, before you leave the room. <laughs> okay. Since you are the table talk master, can you, yes, yes, Doug, can you give Helen a simple question in which she has to give an opinion? Just a simple question. Very good. Helen, what is your perspective on professional sports, specifically the American pastime, also known as baseball? Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to do right now about 20 seconds. You're going to do it in front of the audience. You're just going to share your take on baseball. Go. Baseball is actually my husband and some of my, one of my son's favorite sport to watch on TV. Personally, I do not like baseball. I think it's such a slow game. I prefer to watch basketball. So baseball to me, sometimes um, I've been to lots of stadiums, lots of games. Not of my own choosing, really. But I just go <laughs> to be with family. Okay, let me pause you right here. Now, when you were sharing this notion with the audience, what were you looking for in the audience? What were, you, what were your eyes searching for? I was searching for just to inform them of how I feel about baseball. When you say that you were looking for somebody to say, yes, I agree with you, right? Somebody yes. says, I feel the same way. So right now, as you're looking at this audience, there was this belief that's in front of you, I need to be right, right? And when you, when you have it in front of you, you act in kind. You say, okay, well, I'm, the way I'm delivering, I'm trying to be reasonable. I'm trying to create this persona of Helen is this reasonable person. She wants to show you maybe controversial, but I hope that somebody in the room agrees with me. Baseball sucks, right? <laughs> right? Okay. So what was the action? If you were thinking about what you just said, what would be that one action you would want the audience to take? Somebody, if any one person. I'm hoping someone doesn't like baseball like me. <laughs> All right, so let's just take with that. You're, you're, what you're really saying when you're giving your reason is that you're hoping someone in the audience says, do, does not like baseball. Do not like baseball. What it comes down to is do not like baseball. I want you to take Doug's question again. And I want you in your mind, don't say do not like baseball, but have it in your mind. That that's the subtext of what you're saying. Now give your reason again, but treat it as an inquiry that you want to explore. You want to have the audience explore why they should not like baseball, do not like baseball. So in your mind, bring them toward not liking baseball in your reply. Okay? 20 seconds, and we'll just, we'll just go with it. And audience, observe how differently she acts. Go. Baseball, although it's considered an American sport, actually a lot of money and time goes into the sport. Just think of all the stadiums built all over the U.S., how much people pay to go to see a baseball game, and then how much time and also food consumed actually while watching baseball. I think to me it's, it's kind of a waste of time and money because um, it, it's a sport that... Uh, it, it's a good sport, but it, it, it is just very slow, I think the games are, and I'm not really in support of the teams. Yet. Okay, I'm going to pause you right here. Now, I'm going to ask the audience, what did you notice different, like how she was with you? Anybody? A little more confident. Yeah. She seemed more confident. Mm -hmm. She seemed more assertive. Right, and she smiled more. She <laughs> smiled more. <laughs> Helen, when you were doing it the second time, did you notice that you were more emotionally engaged? Mm -hmm with your material. I was trying to persuade. You were trying yeah. to persuade, but when you were looking at the audience, what were you getting from them? Um, it seemed like I got some nods. <laughs> you got some nods, right? Yeah. Because people were feeling what you were saying. Did you notice that the first time you were speaking, you felt like your reasons were kind of in here, right? They were sort of, this is, I'm just sharing with you guys, I'm hoping you come to me, my thoughts are in here. Did you notice how the second time you did your thoughts were more out there? They were just in the room, so to speak, right? We're going to have everybody do that right now. We're going to pair off right now. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, we do pair, <laughs> offs in, pair offs in groups. And what you're going to do is, to the left of you, we're going to do another question. Um, let's do an opinion of what's your favorite color? 
Okay. And to the left, to the person left of you, so you do pair, pair, pair. You just, we're just going to do 20 seconds. Where you're just going to share with that, that person why whatever your favorite color is your favorite color. We'll do about 20 seconds of it. So pair, 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 and pair. Okay. And then Teresa and Bruno. Yeah. Um, one person would do it right now for the other person. Just simply share with your partner you 20 seconds which is yeah. okay. okay. your favorite color. Okay. Okay. So my favorite like color is turquoise. My favorite color is, is red. I own a lot of turquoise. And the reason is I grew up. My so laptop is turquoise. My phone case is turquoise. I like the pink and the red. And it makes things really interesting. Also, because the most sunburned condition is always going to be all excited. So I thought about this way. It brings out the most my favorite color. It's a lot easier. And that's how we express our emotions. Just gonna pause it right here, so guys. Okay, so everybody kind of knows what they would probably would say in that situation about their favorite color. Now I want you to think and imagine that the message or the action that you really want to give the other person is choose my favorite color. If it's blue. Choose blue as the next time you have a paint that you have to apply or a shirt you want to wear. Choose blue. That's the action that you want in your mind. Imagine now that you, you're going to do the same thing again, but treat it as whatever your argument is, as an inquiry into that action, which is choose this color. For what situation? Do that with your partner. Just go about 20, 30 seconds. Share your opinion, but treat it as an inquiry. Go. Okay. So, Don't you like self expression? When you go to a car show, so you can look at all these fancy either color old that is vintage or new vehicles. What are the what colors, colors that attract you the most? I think the color that attracts you the most is red. It's a color that is just an that really catches people. It's always beautiful, especially all the essence that you have. Which is my favorite color. It's pretty red. So, it's pretty red. And also, when you go to a car show, you're going to know what's going on. And I'm going to pause right now. Okay. So, okay, Teresa and Bruno, who spoke? Okay. Bruno, what did you notice between the first and second time Teresa spoke to you? It was more specific. More specific? Yeah, I think she gave examples as opposed to just how she felt about it. Terms. What did you feel in terms of her vibe, her connection, her demeanor? Generally higher energy. Higher energy, more engaging, right? Yeah. She seemed more conversational. She seemed as if she wanted to engage with you, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what did you notice with your partner? So first time around she was explaining why she liked the color, the practicality of it. Second time around, she's telling me I'm not going to have bad dreams. My dream is pain. Why I should buy into this color. <laughs> she's like a salesperson the second time around. You feel like she was more like a salesperson. Did you notice Did you notice anything different in how her face read or how her eyes seemed? Did she how her eye contact? It seemed more at ease the second time around, I thought. Okay. Uh, I, can't, I wasn't paying that much attention to eye contact. I think it's about the same. Okay. What did you notice differently in her voice? You know, it's seem more, yeah, seem more energetic and animated second time around. More energetic and more, more in the moment, right? Like she was really trying to communicate with you, as opposed to just putting it out there. Here's some things. Here's some things. Here's some things. Do you agree with me? Right? She's more like, here's what's on the table, right? Okay. What did you, Martin? What did you notice with your partner? Well, we actually cheated, so uh, <laughs> he did it the first time, and then I did it the second time. Okay, so collectively, what did you notice in terms of well, the so, vibe? Well, uh, so Paul, Paul did the first part, so yeah. he, like, you know, as, as Helen and everyone else kind of did, just kind of gave their own sort of internal yeah. experiences and preferences without, I don't know, it, it, I mean, it, it's, I think it's, it's that position of being guarded where you don't want anyone to sort of attack you, so you're basically defending your right. opinion rather than really trying to convince someone of it. So what did she notice differently when you did it? I mean, I was trying to convince him of it, 100%. I, I was, in fact, I, I specifically picked the opposite color of what he picked, just to, <laughs> to, try, to try to sell him on it. Uh, Paul, what did you notice from Mark? Yeah, so I think um, when he was trying to convince me of, so I chose black and he chose white. Um, and he was trying to convince me of white, it was, it was a lot more, this is why, you, it's like the salesperson, no, it's like, he was like, this is why you choose it. And he was then taking my color and I'm being like, this is why you shouldn't choose that. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
<laughs> and how about what did you notice with with Aaron? With Aaron, he talked the first time he talked about the reasons why he liked the color red. He had good support for it. But the second time, he was like a total salesperson. <laughs> he asked oh, so many questions. At the end of it, I'm ready to go out and buy a red dress today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. now, I was observing you too. One thing I didn't notice was Aaron. When the second time you did, you you leaned forward. You were instead of the first time you were just sharing across the room and just going like this. The second time you were zeroing in on Helen, saying, "This is the position," and this is. And one thing I noticed by everybody here, you weren't trying to impose your view. You were inviting them. You were inviting them to take a perspective and hopefully move into this action. This is just one example of one type of engagement. When, for example, how many of you are in staff meetings or meetings where you vociferously disagree with what's going on in the meeting, right? And all you want to do is when you're in this meeting, you just want to be heard, right? Okay, I don't like that report. That report's completely wrong. I can tell you the last month, our results are nothing like that, right? There's a part of you that wants to be heard. But as you're being heard, then you notice how it's all still trapped in here, mm -hmm. right? You're hoping that somebody wakes up and goes, oh, you're right. Or, you know what? You're in control. You know what you're talking about. We want you to lead the next meeting. There's a part of you that's always mm -hmm. hoping for that. You're hoping for somebody in the room will engage with you. So here's the paradox. The more you attached you are to your audience, the less attached you are to whatever your message, your story, your speech is. Then that's the paradox here. It's if I, for example, if I'm sharing a story about my brother's wedding, it's very hard for me not to talk about him being very emotional. But notice something, especially for those of you who've been Toastmasters a while, whenever we're talking about something like that, we have a deep attachment to, but we're in front of an audience. We tend to do this a lot, right? We tend to we tend to show and kind of bump up our energy. Why are we doing this? Because the more we care about something, the more I search for somebody in the room to go, do you feel what I'm feeling? Do you feel what I'm feeling? And until somebody in the room does the nod, we don't settle down. But imagine that you're, look, whatever you're caring about, this whole audience that you're looking at right now, you're searching for everybody as if it's American Idol or just in the same. I like your message. No, your message sucks. I don't understand your point. I'm confused by you. You're looking for somebody to put out that sign that says, okay, you have permission to talk. But imagine, imagine if you can engage with people and whatever you're passionate about. If you want to share a story about your brother's wedding, you want to share, you want to make a selling point about why we need to go with SAP over another system, you can take it and put it out there. The more that you care about what it is in you, you share it out there. And we're going to move on to the next thing, storytelling. Who here has a favorite favorite restaurant or favorite movie? Favorite restaurant, right? Everybody here probably has a favorite restaurant. Okay, now the person on the right, I want you to share with the person on the left. I think it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Or is it the person? Yeah. We do? Okay. The person <laughs> on the right share with the partner. No, the person on the left share with the, the person on the right. Person. Yeah, the opposite <laughs> person. Yeah. Uh, share a story, just a brief anecdote about your favorite restaurant. Good. Okay. Go. <laughs> Recently, I've been to a restaurant that I've been to before a long time ago, but I forgot why it's called Lemonade. It was one of the fabulous uh, here, and there's so many locations. But I love their food. They have a big salad bar, and there's a salad bar, super packed with sandwiches. Probably because they have really good food, as much as it is you want. And I keep telling my friends, I just can't wait to eat there every day, I think. And also, the interior of it is probably too late. It's a little bit of a club feeling that we have. I want to pause right here. I want to pause right here. And okay, the person listening, just taking into account, observe the, just taking into account the body language, the vibe, their just your general focus on you, and also observe. Do you get the vibe from them? Are they trying to get you to agree with them? Are they trying to get you to like them? Are they trying to get you to decide whether or not you're a credible, authentic person? Just observe that. Now I'm going to switch this around. 
you know, one thing I love about you know a restaurant is it may be a great, great, um, great vibe or delicious food. Imagine that you have this belief, which is, I love this restaurant because it has the best food in town. I mean, keep that in mind. That's the belief you want. You know, your belief is that this is the best food in town. I want you to share the story again, but treat it as an invitation to this belief that whatever restaurant it is, whether or not it's McDonald's or it's Morton's, that this is the best restaurant. This is the best restaurant out there. This is what you believe. So share that story again, but treat it as an invitation to that belief. Okay, go with that. And run, go. Have you ever been so, to the restaurant? Like, you see this menu from top to bottom, all these different delicious foods, from the, 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 the like seafood, beef, or they have chicken, pork, pretty much every food you can imagine. And they are very careful to serve things more fresh, like in small portions too, so you get to try all sorts of different things. They don't pay kind of limitations. They don't order maybe two or three things at a time. Uh, but you, you can try everything on the menu for ten dollars. It's pretty reasonably priced. Uh, as well, uh, 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 so it's all the rooms. It's, it's the can't go wrong. Let's go. And I'm gonna right here. See the ocean. Okay. So you, sir, when you were listening to your partner, what did you notice between the first and second talk? One of the things that was pretty clear to me when I went to the second talk. He used, he used much more descriptive language, and he started to describe what the environment was like, and he tried to explain in your terms that made the food at George's mm -hmm. much more attractive along with the environment. Again, the, the use of descriptive words was much more evident in his second speech. Did you notice that as he was using this description, it was almost like he was paving a road? To go to have you go there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, right. It sounded like the Garden of Eden. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you notice in your interaction? Um, uh, yes. I think the first thing I noticed was that in the second time we went around, uh, there was more of a hook. There was like, imagine that you're at this like really awesome place. Um, but now, like that, I'm kind of hearing about everyone's responses and how how the second time goes around. I'm wondering if the second time is more descriptive just because we've already talked about it the first time and we don't want to say the same thing. <laughs> right, and good point, right, good point, good point. And I wanted to use the same topic because I just want you right now to focus on the attention. But the next part we will actually, we're going to demonstrate a difference. Okay, and Paul, what did you notice with Martin, the difference? So with Martin, I think the first time he was trying to say like, okay, I like it, you may not like it, but it's kind of that attitude. So he's like, um, it's not the best restaurant out there. So he's giving like excuses for why I may not like it. But the second time, he went down to explain why a B rating is better than an A rating um, and why I should go there. So he, he like gave me solid evidence and this is why you should go there. Okay, that's good. That's good. Ellen, what did you notice with uh, well, uh, Aaron? What I noticed, um, I noticed the first time similarly, I mean similar to what they said, You, she was trying to explain, well, this is why I like it, and for me, I got the message, well, I know Helen likes this restaurant, so I'm going to put that association. The second time, she painted a picture, she got excited, and I was like, oh, yeah, I do like that. That is a priority for me, too. I guess I need to see what Helen is talking about, you know, so it was a difference. So, for all the people that were listening to your partner, did you notice that as the person was telling the story the second time, you started to literally see their story? Mm -hmm. You literally started to walk in their shoes. This is what happens when you put a story out there. This is what happens when you put your opinion out there. When you really do put it out there, the reality distorts, right? In that very one moment, they literally see that restaurant. They literally see themselves putting that color on. Now, to your point about, okay, let's try this with totally fresh subjects. I want to reiterate the two messages for right now. A story is always an invitation to a belief. Sometimes you got to give really bad news. That's still an invitation to a belief. And when you're giving an opinion or a reason, it's an inquiry. When you're really engaging with an audience, it's an inquiry into an action. And it could be the same thing where you're giving a point, you're giving an opinion, 
and it may not, it not be one the other person wants to take. You may say, you may tell somebody, go, I want a divorce, right? This marriage is not working. It's still an inquiry. It's still digging into the hole. So inquiry and invitation. Now I'm going to ask Teresa. Think of one table topic question, a simple table topic question. Okay. And now I'm going to ask Martin to come back up here. Okay. <laughs> 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 Teresa, and I'm, it won't be a full name table talk. Okay. It will just be a short one. But Teresa, offer Martin a simple table talk question. Yes, Martin. Tell us about a favorite vacation spot that you've been to that it was not what you expected it to be. Okay, so to be, right before you begin, it, would you agree that it sounds like a story? It doesn't sound like she's an invitation to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Okay, now before you begin, imagine that whatever story that you're telling, it's an invitation. That is, you're, you're sharing the story, but the subtext is you're inviting them to see what you have saw. Okay, and now I will interrupt you, I will close you out before you finish. Don't worry about that. Okay. But Telling the story, invite them to your perspective. Go. So imagine you arrive at the southernmost tip of the country of Poland, and you're looking up at where are supposed to be these beautiful mountains, and all you see is just clouds and an angry sky. You feel like you're about to die, and you don't know what you're going to be doing there, but the person that you're with decides, hey, you know, this is going to be okay. These clouds are often kind of deceptive, and we're going to be fine. So you start going up start walking through the woods, there's gentle rain falling on your head, there's steam rising off your body, and you really feel kind of the calm stillness and the, the beautiful smells of the woods coming out as the moisture kind of seeps into everything. Okay. Well, I want to keep going. <laughs> Share a personal story about experiencing this. But the subtext is, is almost like as you're telling it, as if, if I was at a, if I was if I was on a date, right, if I'm on a date and I'm sharing a personal story, it's almost like I'm telling you about the skiing, skiing lodge, right? We have this wonderful skiing lodge and all my friends are there and have the most beautiful this and that. As I'm telling, the subtext is I want you to invite you there. I want you, I want you to come. I want you to see what I see. Share a personal story of what it was like in Poland. Just one short one, just about 30 seconds. But the subtext is the invitation to see, to, see, to come to see Poland that way. All right, go. Are, is this the same? Yeah, it's the, the same, same story. Just continue with what you did now. Share a personal story, like one childhood story. Very short. That was already kind of a personal story, but okay. But that was <laughs> yeah. I mean, do it from my eye point. Do it from, okay, I was doing this, I was doing that. But the subtext is treated as an, almost like as you're telling the subtext, your attention is, is to invite the person. Okay? Go. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of really cool things to do when you go hiking in Poland. Uh, there's a... Uh, interesting trails that kind of go throughout the mountains that are kind of different from what you see in the U.S. In the U.S. you go up to the peak and back, so you're basically either going really hard, hard up or down the whole time. In Poland you kind of go up to a peak and then you kind of go around the ridges, so you're seeing perspectives of different mountains. It's very interesting to get you know different viewpoints of uh, different parts of the mountains and of the forests and, and the hills and everything. Uh, I don't know how to Make it more That's fine. That's okay. fine. I'm just going to end you right there. Okay. But I'm going to ask the audience, what did you notice in terms of his presence with you guys? Anybody? He walked up towards us more. One thing I noticed uh, right off the bat was that you wanted to visualize. You actually, you actually came a little bit forward. Okay. And your eyes were really on everybody. Your eyes were really on everybody. You were really focused. The, the reason why I brought you up here is because I saw you doing table tops before. Mm -hmm. And when you were doing tables before, you're looking at different points of the audience. You're saying, okay, did I get my message? Did I get my message? Here, you were just focused on one or two people. You held that gaze, and then you move on to the next person. Even though this was, even though we kind of did a twist here you know, in two versions of it, what did you notice differently about how you were looking at the audience? And what did they seem to you? How did it occur to you? Uh, I mean, for me, I'm 
I don't know. I, I guess the the length of the gaze that I was holding, I didn't really even notice that. Right, you don't notice that at um, all. But what did you notice in terms of the vibe? I think a few people were leaning in a little more. Um, I guess the, the second time. When, I mean, I, I, and again, I don't know how much of that is just that you're giving us direction, so it's kind of expect everyone's expecting to hear something a little more personal or interesting, so they're kind of automatically okay. leaning in more. Okay. Yeah. But one thing you did notice is that if you were You've told stories, you told other stories before mm -hmm. in your prepared speeches or in table topics. What did you notice differently between those times and this time? In terms of how you saw the audience, how did it seem to you? Uh, I think this time was, it, I saw the audience more as a uh, kind of a challenge in the sense that I was trying to uh, picture or, or visualize things that for each of them would be something that's that they would be interested in. Whereas previously, I'm kind of thinking more, I guess, myself. What what did I experience? What did I kind of see and think? You notice how when you were focused on the audience, you felt like you were getting feedback or data, right? Yeah. Did you feel like in, previously before when you're sharing stuff about your life, you're getting information from the audience in that way, but you're almost putting it onto yourself. Do they like, do they like what I'm saying? Do they mm -hmm. feel what I'm saying? Do they understand? Do they see? what I'm sharing, whereas now it's saying, okay, that worked, that didn't work, let's move to this, let's move to that, right? Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is an example of what we call engagement without attachment, or intention without expectation. There's two versions of what we call that. And this is like the basis of true charisma. Most professional speakers, most people who are in TED, if you watch one of the really high point TED Talks, they all do the same thing. When they're giving an opinion, they're giving their argument on something, it's not to persuade the audience that they're right. It's an it's a inquiry into, I want you all to be like scientists and explore this with me right now. And the same thing with when you're sharing stories. They're not merely sharing stories to entertain or to say, oh, do you see what I'm seeing? It's like a really great conversation you're having with a friend you're sharing those kind of stories, it's an invitation into seeing what I'm seeing. That's always the subjects in what you're doing. When you do that, when you do these two things, how you see their eyes completely, completely changes. The very same gaze is that says, well, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. You, instead of taking it as saying it's a reflection of me, or I'm not being a very clear person, I'm not an intelligent person, I'm not a likable person. Those, those judgments that kind of cloud and make you react subconsciously in the moment, instead you just see it as data. You're now following where the audience is going and you're managing it. You're always managing it. So we talked about two of the engagements. There are four. When you are giving speeches, if you practice giving stories and treating them as an invitation, making your arguments and treating them as an inquiry, when you're asking questions, treat them as a declaration of what we're about to talk about. And then finally, when you're getting to your message, to treat it as a sign up in a moment, when you are comfortable in these four modes, this not only elevates your speaking game, when you are in those difficult staff meetings, you will find that as you're speaking, action is now happening in that room. Things are going to be done in that room. So instead of being immediately heard, you're now making a difference. If you're interested in more, you can talk to me after the meeting. We do a whole section where we do a lot more experiential. And if you take this information, it will elevate your game to the matter level. I had fun as your educational presenter, and now I'm going to bring back up Aaron. Thank you.